welcome to everyone joining us live today for the webinar. We're delighted to bring you this webinar as part of our epilepsy awareness events during the month of November. So let me jump right in and introduce our two speakers for today. Dr. Caleb Yohe is an Associate Professor of Clinical Neurology at NYU Langone Medical Center in Manhattan, New York, and serves as the co-director of the NYU Langone Comprehensive Neurofibromatosis Center. Dr. Yohe has been engaged in clinical and translational research, including projects developing novel therapeutic approaches for nervous system tumors, and has participated in an ongoing clinical trial of gene therapy for Batten disease. Our second speaker is Dr. Margie Frazier, who is the Executive Director of the Batten Disease Support and Research Association. The association is dedicated to funding research for treatments and cures, advancing education, providing family support services, advocating within state and federal governments on behalf of families, and raising awareness of Batten disease and its impact. Founded in 1987, Batten Disease Support and Research Association is the largest support and research organization dedicated to Batten disease in North America. Welcome to everyone, and we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, uh, as Amanda said, my name is Caleb Yohe. I'm a pediatric neurologist at NYU Langone. And as a neurologist, um, as a pediatric neurologist especially, we are frequently faced with uh, evaluating kids who present with a first seizure or um, series of seizures, which results in a diagnosis of epilepsy. And one of our primary roles is try to try to identify the, the, the cause of the seizure or seizures and um, we spend a lot of our time and effort uh, trying to, to identify those causes. Um, we often look for structural uh, or uh, injury uh, to the brain, um, and if we can't find a specific um, structural or acquired etiology, um, we are often left with uh, an understanding that it's probably a genetic cause, and as time has gone on, uh, a larger and larger percentage of epilepsies have been associated with specific genetic causes. When we see a child with epilepsy and, and a genetic, what we presume to be a genetic cause of the seizures, we then try to decide whether or not this is a, a gene that's causing seizures as the primary manifestation, or is this part of a larger, uh, more global um, uh, underlying syndrome. And one of the syndromes that uh, can account for epilepsy in kids is uh, Batten's disease, our topic for today. Uh, Batten's disease is also known as uh, neuronal serial lipofusinosis, um, and it's, it's really a group of uh, several different uh, disorders, uh, most of which are autosomal recessive, uh, genetic disorders, uh, and they are all characterized by dysfunction of the lysosomes, which are an essential organelle uh, in cells or processing uh, debris and, and essentially cellular trash. It's a very rare set of disorders with an incidence of only about uh, 0 0.1 to 8 per 100,000 live births. Um, and so this is really one of the rare of the rare disorders in the um, genetic epilepsies. The classic clinical triad um, that we see in people with uh, an NCL or neuronal steroid lipofusinosis is epilepsy, um, then either cognitive decline or dementia, and visual impairment, progressive visual impairment. Epilepsy can be a very prominent feature and is often the presenting feature, uh, especially in the early onset NCLs. So kids with uh, NCL that prevent, present in infancy, either congenital or early infancy, um, will often present with seizures as either the first or second symptom, whereas kids with later onset uh, disease, the epilepsy may not be the first symptom and may be the second, third, or even fourth uh, symptom that uh, shows up. The NCLs have a very variable age of onset and also rate of progression, and um, historically they've been classified um, by the time of onset and described as either infantile, late infantile, juvenile, or, and adult or late onset. Next slide, please. Just briefly to talk a, a little bit about the history of Batten disease, um, it's obviously been around for probably 
hundreds or thousands of years, but it was first described by a Norwegian primary care physician uh, by the name of Otto Christian Stengel. Uh, in 1826, he published a paper, the first paragraph is there on the right, uh, written in Norwegian, uh, describing a family with um, three kids with uh, symptoms that we can now recognize as being juvenile uh, MCL. In 1843, Adolf Hanover, a pathologist, um, identified uh, lipofusin granules in nerve cells and associated with uh, a degenerative condition. And this was really the first pathologic description associated with the MCLs. In the early 1900s, uh, there were multiple descriptions of uh, clinical cases uh, that we now know are Batten's disease. Uh, in 1903, Frederick Batten described two cases that we uh, would associate with juvenile MCL as well. Um, in the next couple of decades, uh, several other authors presented uh, their work, and as a result, uh, Batten disease um, and the, the all of the MCLs uh, underwent a, an explosion of naming. And I will say that you know neurology is uh, full of eponymous diseases, diseases named for specific people, but Batten's disease uh, probably holds the record for the most number of names associated with it, including Spielmeier and Vogt um, and Cust and, and many others. Um, and we these days refer to the NCLs uh, as Batten disease, although previously Batten disease really referred just to juvenile NCL. Um, but it can get confusing at times. In 1969, uh, the concept or term uh, NCL was first introduced, um, and really this was the first time that the NCLs were understood to be a separate entity from uh, other disorders like sex. In 1995, the first gene associated with NCL was described, CLN1 uh, was identified, and between uh, 1995 and now, uh, there's been, again, sort of an explosion in our understanding of the genetic etiologies of the NCLs. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see here, there's 14 different clinical uh, disorders in the NCLs in the, in the latest classification scheme, and 13 genes have been identified uh, for these 14 disorders, uh, all of which are autosomal uh, recessive with the exception of CLN4, which is autosomal dominant. Um, and you can see there on the right the gene product that's been associated with the, um, the specific mutations. Uh, and in the second column, you can see all the various eponyms that have been associated with, uh, with these disorders. Um, in brief, uh, as I mentioned before, there are multiple types basically that are described according to the age at which uh, the onset is most common uh, and the progression uh, of the disorder. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, epilepsy is a very prominent component or symptom of MCL. Um, and it's really very, very varied. Uh, you can see essentially any seizure type uh, as part of the clinical scenario for these kids. Um, you can see generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, you can see partial complex seizures. You can see absence seizures. Um, and you can frequently see myoclonus and myoclonic seizures. Of note, uh, there are differences in terms of the different subtypes of MCL uh, in terms of the types of epilepsy that we, we tend to see, although all of them can be associated with essentially all seizure types. So, but for instance, CLN1 uh, or the congenital form of the, of the disorder, um, it frequently starts with myoclonus and myoclonic seizures and then evolves into generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Um, children with CLN2 or the late infantile uh, type um, can present with generalized tonic-clonic, but myoclonic seizures often are a prominent component of the symptomatology. And these kids can also get partial complex and absence seizures. Juvenile NCL or CLN3 uh, kids tend to have more generalized tonic-clonic seizures and may or may not have associated myoclonus. For these disorders, the seizure types can evolve over time, and it's starting with one type and, and over the course of the disease changing into different types. Um, and the seizures can change both in terms of frequency and duration and severity uh, 
during the course of the disease. In general, the seizures that we see in kids with MCL are very poorly responsive to medication. Uh, medications can be used to ameliorate the symptoms of seizures to some extent, but getting complete control of seizures is uh, unusual. Next slide, please. So uh, alluding back to what I was saying before, um, a lot of times uh, when we are uh, seeing a child with a, a seizure, we tend to focus on the seizure or the epilepsy initially um, and focus on treating it. And then we have to sort of back up and, and try to take in the big picture to try to understand what the, the forest is, what is really going on as a, as a cause for the seizures. And this is particularly true in, in Batten's disease where um, we use certain clues to help us decide where else to look in, in terms of um, the epilepsy. So epilepsy is the presenting symptom, but the, the plus part of it, you know, epilepsy plus, what other symptoms or signs uh, are in association with the seizures that might tip us off that there is a larger underlying issue going on that should trigger a, a larger workup for other uh, potential etiologies and specifically um, looking for Batten's disease. The first and perhaps uh, the most obvious would be um, if you were to see a child with seizures who has a family history of NCL in a sibling or um, in a second or third degree relative, then obviously you would uh, be at higher alert for thinking about uh, NCL uh, in that particular individual. One of the most, and probably the most common uh, plus feature associated with epilepsy in kids with Batten's are either developmental plateauing, so development slowing down and then um, essentially halting, or even regression where milestones are lost uh, over time. And this can be particularly noticeable in language, uh, but can also be seen in um, cognition. Um, learning and as well as motor, uh, and in particular, gait, um, with kids presenting with uh, impairment in gait and, and ataxia. Another feature that is a tip-off uh, for us to look for um, battens would be uh, progressive vision impairment. And this is a, a symptom that really would uh, necessitate further evaluation in almost any child with uh, epilepsy. Uh, microcephaly is a fairly nonspecific uh, feature that we uh, see commonly in kids with epilepsy, but particularly in a newborn with epilepsy uh, and microcephaly, that might trigger a, an evaluation for Batten's disease. Um, the seizures themselves can also have characteristics that would lead us to think about disorders like Batten's. Um, so if the epilepsy are partic is particularly difficult to control um, over time, um, seizures that are evolving and changing uh, type over time or changing in severity. Um, and if there's associated myoclonus or myoclonic seizures, um, these also are all uh, factors that might lead for, to further work up for uh, Batten's or MCL. Um, so I put together just a, um, uh, a, a diagram just to help show how we approach the diagnosis of NCL for, for a child where this might be suspected. Um, this is adapted from a, a paper published in 2013 by uh, Dr. Schultz et al. Um, and, uh, I just want to note that this is specifically for kids um, who uh, present with symptoms that might be suggestive of Batten's and um, I don't include the adult population in this particular um, algorithm. But essentially we start off with a, a child with epilepsy plus some other um, symptom and then we think about um, uh, three different age groups. Is it a, a newborn, um, or is it a, an infant, uh, or is it an older child? And if we were to see a newborn with microcephaly, um, we might continue on down the path of uh, testing for uh, specific enzymatic deficiencies, so cathepsin B, um, which can be associated with uh, CLN10. Um, so if the enzyme test is positive, uh, we would then uh, proceed with genetic testing for CLN10. Um, 
for uh, an infant with a presenting feature of epilepsy uh, with associated developmental plateauing or regression. We would start off with enzyme testing for PPT1, which is associated with CLN1, and TPP1, which is associated with CLN2. If the enzyme testing is positive, then we would do genetic testing for the associated genes, so PPT1 for CLN1 and TPP1 for CLN2. If the testing was negative, we'd proceed with electron microscopy to look for uh, specific features that would um, either um, support a diagnosis of Batten or uh, refute it. If the electron microscopy is positive, we would then send genetic testing for uh, other uh, potential etiologies um, such as CLN5, 6, 7, 8, and 14. For a school-age child that presents with visual loss or cognitive decline in the setting of epilepsy, we would start off with uh, just a straight blood smear. Um, and children with CLN3 uh, will typically have vacuoles uh, visible in their blood smear. So if, if vacuoles are, are seen, we would do CLN3 testing to confirm the diagnosis. If the blood smear is negative for vacuoles, uh, we would proceed with uh, enzyme, enzyme testing for PPT1, TPP1, and capepsin D, um, and if that was positive, we would do the associated genetic test with the, that specific enzyme deficiency. If that is negative, we would go back to electron microscopy, and similarly, um, we would then proceed with genetic testing uh, for additional forms of, of NCL if electron microscopy uh, was supportive of a diagnosis. So that's the uh, general approach uh, in terms of uh, diagnostics uh, for kids suspected of having NCL. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Kids with NCL um, uh, really have multi-system um, disease, and we um, are learning that more and more um, as, uh, as we take care of these kids. Um, and unfortunately, at this point, we are, uh, outside of clinical trials, really limited to sy um, symptomatic treatment of, of kids with MCL. Um, and just some general principles of care um, for, for kids with MCL. Um, first, and perhaps most important, is that it's really important to work in partnership, uh, both with the patient and the family, in terms of making decisions um, about treatment and balancing um, quality of life um, with the treatments um, that we have available to us, which are, are somewhat limited and often come with associated significant side effects. And, and really the goal should be to treat to maximize the quality of life. We don't want to stop seizures at the cost of completely eliminating the chance for kids to be awake and alert and interactive with their families, for instance. Um, it's also important to recognize that this is a degenerative condition, and over time, um, symptoms will evolve um, as a result of that. As the brain changes, um, the symptoms will change, and the treatments that we're using to um, address specific features of the disorder will need to be adjusted accordingly. Um, and sometimes in, in treating patients with NCL, it is um, a, a game of catch-up frequently uh, because things are often changing. Um, as quickly as you can get a handle on them. As I alluded to earlier, it really is important that we aim for good seizure control, but the reality is that we can't really expect complete seizure uh, control, uh, and nor can we expect that we're going to normalize the EEG in kids with MCL. Um, these seizures are really refractory to treatment, um, and kids may go through long periods without seizures, but um, will frequently have breakthrough seizures um, um, throughout uh, their lives. Uh, a general uh, goal is to use as many medications as needed, but really to limit the number of medications as, as much as possible. Again, to, to, to address this balance of um, efficacy with, um, with side effects. And when we add two or three seizure medicines, we may not really improve seizure control very much, but we are likely to increase the uh, amount of side effects that patients are experiencing. So it's, it's really important to try to minimize the number of drugs. And also to remember as, as the disease evolves, you may be able to peel off drugs at certain times and, and limit the numbers that way as well. 
Um, it's also sometimes possible to double dip uh, in terms of medication. So if you're treating a movement disorder or behavioral problem, um, you may be able to choose a medicine that also could be used for uh, epilepsy or seizures. Next slide, please. Um, just some general um, drugs that we, we tend to use in kids with, with NCL. Um, in treating the epilepsy, uh, drugs that are frequently used include valproate, uh, lamictal or lamotrigine, topiramate, um, kepra or levetiracetam. Um, benzodiazepines can be used um, as abortive medications such as diazepam or lorazepam um, for use in kids with prolonged seizures or status epilepticus, but can also be used more chronically in, uh, in these kids, um, drugs such as clonazepam or clobazam. Um, in the population that I see or have seen the most frequently, which is um, late infantile uh, NCL, um, a lot of the kids ended up on uh, long-term benzodiazepine use for seizure management with, with, with uh, definite benefit. There are certain drugs that we tend to avoid in the NCLs because they have been demonstrated to uh, have the potential to exacerbate seizures, um, and that includes uh, carbamazepine um, and oxcarbamazepine, uh, phenytoin or dilantin, uh, vagabutrin, and gabapentin. Um, I'm not really going to go into details of treatment of behavior or myclonus spasticity, but um, again, just to point out that sometimes there is the opportunity to treat both the epilepsy and other symptoms of the disorder um, with drugs that can be used for both. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned before, this really is a multi-system disorder, and, and it is really important for um, kids with the NCLs to be taken care of in a, a multidisciplinary, uh, coordinated uh, way, um, preferably in a, in a system where there are people with good familiarity with um, the disease, which can be difficult with such a rare disease. Um, but families with uh, children with NCL are going to need access to occupational and physical therapists, um, social workers to help um, coordinate care and um, help with the financial issues around um, uh, around insurance, as well as um, the psychosocial and emotional issues that are um, faced by uh, families with kids with NCL. Uh, neurologists and epileptologists are going to be helpful in managing the seizures. Uh, geneticists and genetic counselors are going to be helpful in um, initially with the diagnosis, but then also in terms of um, assessing whether or not other family members members need to be screened. Um, and for counseling around that. Um, physiatrists are going to work with the occupational physical therapist as well as the neurologist to help um, with adaptive equipment and um, making decisions about the need for treatments such as Botox. Um, speech and swallow uh, therapists are going to be helpful, uh, as are gastroenterologists and nutritionists. Um, ophthalmologists um, also play an important role. And I, I put respite care here as well. I think um, that this often gets overlooked, but um, families with kids with, with uh, battens often um, really could benefit from uh, help and assistance in terms of um, protected time for themselves and for the rest of the family. And last and certainly not least is an asso association with a uh, parental support network, um, which can really play a, a huge uh, role in supporting um, these families and, and patients with uh, the NCLs. Um, so on that note, I'll, I'll turn it over to Margie from the BDSRA, uh, which is a perfect example of, of such a uh, support network. Thank you, Dr. Yohei. I really appreciate all that you had to share with us today and um, especially your, your help in the Batten world uh, prior to today. And thank you to Amanda and Ambria Genetics as well. And I want to send a special hello to those families who have are, are touched by Batten who are on the call today, and welcome. Um, I'll go quickly through many of these slides because we really do want to get to Q&A with everybody. Um, since 1987, uh, the BDSRA has responded with opportunity and encouragement for many, many families across the world. And last year, we served families in 26 countries. And while we're primarily in, the, in North America, 
we field calls each day from families and physicians all over the world. Um, as Dr. Yohei said, we're the largest support and research association uh, dedicated to baton disease in North America. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in, an, in another couple slides about our research um, program and then family support services as well. So next slide. Um, we use a, a family trauma and loss framework. We believe that these children who are affected are are part of a larger family unit, and everyone in that family unit, including extended family, is taken care of by BDSRA, and that's part of our mantra, is that, that we don't operate in isolation. Um, as you could imagine, having this disease is very traumatic for families, and so we use a trauma and loss um, format in the office to help our staff and our families better understand uh, some of those dynamics and how they can care for themselves and their children on this journey. Um, we believe that the connection with other families is one of the best things that we can provide for families. Um, and so we have a multiple platform for doing this. Uh, we have a closed Facebook group, like many rare diseases, rare disease groups have. Ours is monitored 24 hours a day, and we have nearly 800 family members and uh, caregivers on that page at any one time with access. Um, and some of them are on the call today, and so I'm waving at you here from Columbus, Ohio. Um, we have an excellent website, and we, we invite you to uh, org to visit us and better understand the disease after today's call and some of the things that we provide. You'll find information about the nuts and bolts of care. We have a book center for helping families better understand the disease process, as well as helping siblings understand what's happening to their brothers and sisters. Uh, we can help you locate a testing center. I think one of the most important things we do is offer our annual family conference. Um, our 30th one, our 30-year anniversary conference will actually be in 17, but in 16 we'll be in St. Louis. Anybody on this call is welcome to come. More than happy to be here if you have a, con a connection with Batten and would like to learn more. Uh, we also offer a newsletter, and those are on our website as well. Next slide. Every year we have a research grant program, um, and I and I always say this about the money that goes into those grants every year. This is sacred money. Families have supported this research grant program for years and years and years through lemonade stands and 5Ks and 10Ks and you name it. They're out there oftentimes with very um, sick children. And so our hat's off to them, and they have brought forward uh, um, a research program that some folks on this call are benefiting from today. Um, and so we are, are thrilled about all that they do every year. So I, I want to put special emphasis on that. Um, we have a, a sample here of some of the projects that they're funded in 2015. Um, I'll just let you see those. And we're doing everything from this year we have, I think, nine total product projects, and you can see those on our website as well. Um, we're looking at endpoints. We're looking at a variety of, um, of um, a variety of things. <laughs> I, I could read all these titles, but for those of you who are, are not as interested in the titles but just want to get into the research, I'll, I'll gladly let you do that. Um, I think it's important to mention, too, that currently we have an open letter of intent uh, initiative so that if you are a researcher and you're listening and uh, want to investigate um, getting a, a funding from the BDSRA, um, that round is open now and it will close on January 4th, so you have a little bit of time. It's a one-page letter of intent and then um, those letters are chosen uh, after review for a full for a full uh, proposal that would be honored next July at our annual family conference. Next slide. I 
think it's important, too, to talk about the diagnostic journey. And um, I think journey and odyssey are constantly used. Um, I'd like to look at it in terms of how we look at carbon footprints. I call it the diagnostic footprint. And for me, that means talking to families who've spent years and years trying to find their diagnosis. And that footprint often involves multiple tests, multiple years of not knowing, watching their child uh, lose skills without knowing what's happening, uh, spending enormous amounts of money on flights, hotels, doctor appointments, uh, all, all for naught sometimes in, in three or four years' time until they finally get the CLN disease, CLN, uh, NCL um, diagnosis. And so last year, our organization uh, performed a needs assessment of families to best understand what their journey was like, what the footprint is. And so um, this is the word cloud of all of the diagnoses that our families had gotten prior to a Batten diagnosis. And I thought it was um, something important to show that our families go through a lot before they get to, um, a, to Batten disease. And so um, we know that everybody on this call is going to work to make that shorter for them. Next slide. <clears throat> it's really very important that we concentrate on an early and accurate diagnosis for the reasons I just, I just mentioned. Um, no matter how devastating the disease, parents are desperate to know. And that desperation, I think, filters through the family and causes un undue stress for, for everyone involved. And so if we can reduce that, then let's do that. Families need support to raise their special needs children, period. Um, I would like to say, I think we all want to, all the professionals want to think that we know the disease best, but it, the truth of the matter is, is that families teach us every day. And they are the ones who are the experts in their children, and they need each other. Um, and many of them are on the call today. Finally, as we move into more and more clinical trials, I think it's important to understand that early diagnosis may mean the difference between being in a clinical trial or not. Um, we would hate to learn that we have a trial open and or a treatment available, and it would be too late for that child because we just didn't get them diagnosed in time. So if anyone on the call is struggling with the right diagnosis or or how to find the right resources to do this, please contact us. We are more than help, happy to be helpful in that. Um, a lot of my slides today will have photos of some of our kids. And these two kids, um, one is not with us anymore, and one is. And um, they have never gotten their Batten diagnosis. We're still looking. Because that, I wanted to show you that we we're still in formative stages in diagnosis and, and tests being developed. And so um, we do all we can to continue to learn and help these families cope when they don't know. Next slide. This is the CLN2 family. Um, Amanda asked that I share some photos of our family so that you could better, get a better understanding of, of who they are. and. Um, um, this is a beautiful family who uh, they've been in, they've been very very um, important to the Batten field. Um, on the right are, are uh, Noah and Lane, and that's either right before they were diagnosed with CLN2 or shortly thereafter. And then you can see them with their whole family um, there uh, on the left with their new baby sister, Colette. So you can imagine that for family planning, understanding how, how testing occurs and, and how to plan families is very, very important. Next slide. Um, just to, to be on the lookout, I mean, I've been to many uh, conferences, and, and most people know me by now when I come to their booth and ask them what's on their panel because um, I care very much about what, what are on testing panels. And sometimes you'll see them uh, labeled as NCL. Sometimes you'll see them 
labeled in a different section with just the enzymes. Um, and so it's important to ask companies and um, those um, in charge of the panels where the, where the NCLs are and how many of them are offered. Uh, we work across the country with families uh, and across the world, actually, in obtaining testing for family members. Uh, we, we have a full-time social worker on staff who's very skilled at finding uh, resources for families for testing. And so we are more than happy to do that. It's part of our goal to include as many families as possible. Next slide. This is a, a pictorial of some of the work we do. Um, on, the, on the top left is, is members of our, one of our centers of excellence, uh, nationwide children's here in Columbus. Um, these families are that you see on the right and farther down are all at our family conference this year in Chicago. We had 450 attendees come. Uh, on the left is grandparents. Uh, we have a special special se section just for grandparents, many of whom are full-time caregivers. Um, every year at the conference, we spend lots of time talking with families about research. I think our research program is one of the most hopeful things we do, and I'm every year really overcome by our families whose children are not going to benefit from this research, but whose children um, help other children benefit in the future, either through their parents answering a survey or them giving a, a blood sample or um, participating in a rating scale of some kind. It's, it's truly extraordinary what our families will do for others. Next slide. This is a CLN3 family. Um, we, uh, we love to get these family portraits because they're so, uh, they're so beautiful, aren't they? Um, this young man has been diagnosed with uh, CLN3 uh, as a uh, precursor to his diagnosis, he lost vision um, a couple of years ago, or is beginning to. Um, I don't think he's had seizure activity yet, um, but has significant, significant behavioral problems at school from the dementia and the fear of losing vision. And so um, uh, we're very happy to work with families just like this across the country. We have educational consultants who volunteer for us that we will fly to classrooms to teach families and teachers together how best for these children to be successful in the classroom. Um, I think that's one of the, for the CLN3 family whose child will live um, oftentimes through high school graduation and beyond, I think the school years um, can be especially tough for them and we try to make it as smooth as possible. Next slide. We have a special emphasis on our siblings. We love them. And um, we uh, spend inordinate amounts of time with them at the conference every year. And so this, these photos came from this year at the conference. Next slide. We have adult volunteer um, siblings who come back every year to help the younger ones. It's, a, it's an organization of giving back. And so here's some more pictures of our sibling groups whose brothers and sisters are fat. Next slide. And more of our families. And on the far left-hand corner below is Lance Johnston, who for many, many years was a beacon for so many of our families. And uh, he is the parent of a daughter who had CLN. Um, and really built the organization from the ground up. And I've been in this or in the leadership position now for four years. Next slide. More of our families. And interestingly, the child in the in the middle um, uh, is. Uh, the, the little boy right in the middle photo has a form of CLN2 um, that is a much later onset. And we, we see this, um, what we believe is SCAR7, 
another form of feeling to um, in the population and and uh, especially uh, uh, many more in South America. Next slide. I think one of the most important things that we do as an organization is to remind families that their grief is never time limited, that we are there for them after their children pass, and indeed each time that we send a mailing or a notice of some kind, we often hear from families whose children are gone and they've never contacted us before. They, they, did not, they were not involved in our organization or with other families while their children are alive, but they have now come back or, or reentered for, uh, come in for the first time because they want that connection and it's part of their grief process and we are thrilled to have them. Next slide. This is a family in Utah who uh, took this picture after their daughter died. And I just think it's lovely, and I wanted to share it. Next slide. Our families are truly grateful, truly grateful for all you do for them, for all the professionals, all of the drug companies, all of anybody who's working in the area. They're truly, truly grateful what you're doing. Um, I direct you to the far left photo in the corner in the bottom. This is a reminder that some families lose all of their children to this disease. Um, the woman in the picture is on our board and she's lost her three daughters to that disease, a set of twins and then her oldest child. Next slide. We're very proud of our researchers and are thrilled to work with them every year. Um, without them, um, we just absolutely would not be where we are today with, with treatments, with upcoming um, gene therapy trials and all of that. So our, our, we're, we're thrilled to have them on board and feel very honored. Next slide. One of the most important things I think that BDSRE does is help fund and sponsor and encourage family involvement in the Baton Registry. It's truly a global partnership. And um, you can see all of the countries and all the researchers that are involved um, and the family, family funding foundations as well, Noah's Hope, Hope for Bridget, and others have all come together to help fund this monumental effort. Um, Dr. Schultz, who was uh, seen before in, a, in the algorithm. Um, she's exceptional, and she and her staff uh, organized much of this data. I just got back from Hamburg last week for a registry meeting. It was very exciting. Um, and we're just beginning to really understand what's, what needs to happen and uh, where, where science will take us, really. Uh, so much to learn, um, but it's it's exciting to see all of the data that's in there and what we have to build on. Next slide. Um, our registry provides a standardized longitudinal longitudinal data about bat disease. We use multiple rating scales and natural history information. The data is entered uh, by physicians and nurses research nurses. We're uh, planning to expand into many more countries and we'll be looking at, at funding in order to do that. Um, the DEM child is currently being used um, in the ongoing um, Biomarin trial for solipinase alpha. It's a CLN2 enzyme replacement therapy. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we learn from registries uh, is, is about the diagnostic process and, and what people should be looking for. And so one of the things I think the most profound thing that we've learned even in the last year about the registry, in addition to it being accepted um, as part of, of the, the ERT trial for um, 
for submission for um, FDA and others is that uh, language delay and first seizure at, at, at about three years of age is a reason to test for Batten disease, and we want to continue to push that. Three years old or, or about that age, first seizure and language delay, test for Batten. Um, it's, you know, the enzyme test itself is, is not expensive. Um, it's not rigorous. Um, it, there's no reason not to. It's, we are very intent on making sure, especially as these treatments come on board, that we have as many of these children identified as possible. Uh, next slide. We have several clinical trials that have been ongoing and some that are on deck, so we can talk a little bit about those. Yes. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, sure. So there are several <laughs> clinical trials um, that are ongoing now, um, and there have been several strategies that have been discussed as potential ways to, to think about treating the NCLs. Um, including small molecule therapy, um, enzyme replacement therapy, gene therapy, and, and stem cell therapy. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a little cartoon. Um, the cell on the left is a is a, a cell deficient in um, in this particular cartoon, CLN2. Um, and you, in, in this case, the lysosomes are without uh, the, the necessary lysosomal enzymes to to. Um, carry out the, the necessary functions of the lysosomes. Um, but with gene therapy, there's the opportunity potentially to introduce the, the gene into the nucleus, uh, which would then pr produce the missing protein, TPP1, in the case of CLN2, which then gets modified in the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. And one of the um, opportunities here is that um, you don't have to infect every cell with a, with a viral vector or gene therapy. Um, because the enzyme is released into the extracellular space and then picked up by cells that may not have gotten the um, the repaired uh, gene. So the enzyme deficient cells adjacent to the genetically modified cell will pick up the, the enzyme and um, pull it in to itself and then can utilize the, those enzymes, which um, can um, increase the efficacy of, of gene therapy for LNCL. Stem cell therapy would uh, theoretically operate in a very similar way in, in terms of replacing cells with the functional gene. Next slide, please. For um, some of the uh, NCLs where there's an enzyme deficiency, um, such as CLN1, uh, 2, and, and 10, you could also potentially introduce the enzyme directly into the spinal fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid, or into the brain. And um, the, uh, the enzyme could be picked up similarly uh, into cells that haven't had any modification but could then be utilized by the cells. Next slide. Um, just uh, briefly, there are, you know, as I mentioned before, there are several of the CL, uh, NCLs that are um, uh, caused by a deficiency in, um, in an en specific enzyme. Um, but many of the NCLs are not, and, and those would not be as uh, amenable to treatment with enzyme therapy, but um, other potential um, strategies such as immunomodulation, uh, such as uh, in CLN3, which is uh, currently uh, underway. Next slide, please. So the current treatment trials um, at Cornell in New York City, there's a phase one trial of a viral vector for gene therapy for CLN2. Um, Biomarin is conducting an enzyme replacement therapy for CLN2, and uh, at University of Rochester, they are uh, underway with a phase one trial of CellCept uh, for immune modulation for JNCL. Next slide. Um, and uh, uh, Marty, I think you could speak to the upcoming trials better than I. Uh, yes, they're all gene therapy trials, uh, Abiona. Uh, Therapeutics is uh, investigating a CLN3 option uh, based on the research of Dr. Tammy Keelian, uh, University of Nebraska, who's just exceptional. Spark Therapeutics um, uh, has just announced, actually last week, um, work that they're progressing with in a, in a gene therapy for CLN2. 
and um, many of you may have heard about the Gray Family Foundation moving forward with work in steel and six, and I believe actually some of our researchers um, in that area may be on the call. Um, so we're uh, excited to see in the next year what happens with all of these, and um, we'll be working with families all along the way to keep them informed. Great, thank you both. As we um, bring the webinar to a close and open our Q&A uh, session, we just wanted to highlight the point that Margie was making a little bit earlier, that while every lab organizes testing a bit differently, um, that Ambry does offer genetic testing for all 13 of the known genes for NCL or Batten disease. Um, and at our lab, they are organized in a variety of ways. So all 13 of these genes can be found on our PME Next panel, which is a panel for progressive myoclonus epilepsy. So the 13 NCL genes um, plus several other genes that are known to cause progressive myoclonus epilepsy. Additionally, all 13 of these genes are included in our uh, broader EpiNext. Panel, which is a panel of 100 genes associated with various types of epilepsy. So all 13 of these genes can be found there. And we're excited to announce that coming, um, I would say, this next month, it starts tomorrow, <laughs> coming this next month in December, we will be releasing um, a panel of all 13 genes specifically for NCL or Batten disease, but that'll be available as well. So we did want to close um, the informational portion of the webinar and open the Q&A portion. If people do have questions, please feel free to type them into their Q&A bar and they'll come to us. I have several here. Um, I'd like to pose the first um, question that came across, which is what are the most common types of NCL or what am I most likely to see in the clinic? Um, um, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. You go ahead first. That's good. Um, I was just going to say that uh, CLN1, CLN2, and CLN3 are the most common types of so the infantile and juvenile types um, are the most common. Yeah, and, and I would echo that, especially if you're in North America. Um, though I would say, too, that especially in South America, kind of depending on migration patterns, you know, we see differences. And so... Um, our, our friends in South America will tell us that they'll also see more um, still in 6, 7, and 8 than we will here in the U.S. And so I don't have a lot of data about that, but um, I, think, I think those are interesting to note. Thank you. Um, the next question is, when will there be more information on the CLN late infantile Turkish variant? Almost everything online is about the northern epilepsy variant, EPMR. Uh, that's a really good question, and I think it's a very good prompt for us to uh, spend more time trying to help that, help families with that variant. So I appreciate the question and the prompt. Okay, the next question we have is um, that it was mentioned to do genetic testing for extended family members which extended family members would need testing? Um, well, we certainly, oh, yeah, yeah go ahead. Go ahead, Margie, sorry. <laughs> well, we, we've had a sibling carrier testing program for quite a while um, and uh, work with lots of our families on, on doing that. Um, um, Caleb, I don't know um, how, you know, the kind of counseling you do in your clinic, but you may want to address that. Yeah, I think primarily it is uh, siblings um, uh, mm -hmm. of family members, and sometimes uh, carrier testing is done on the parents um, for uh, reproductive uh, counseling. Sure. Okay, great. And the next question is, how much of Batten disease is explained by the known genes? I don't know the answer to that, Margie, do you? I, I think that's no. a tough question to answer um, and may not be one that um, is, is really known or even able to be answered. Um, yeah. I think that it, you know, the answer is that more and more we're able to identify specific mutations, but I, I don't know what the denominator is. I'd agree with that. 
Um, and there's another question about, uh, this one looks like for Dr. Yohei, about describing your experience working with families who were enrolled on the gene therapy trial. Um, yeah, I, so I worked on the gene therapy trial at Cornell for a couple of years and got to know a lot of the families really um, well. And I'll echo what Margie said, which is I, I feel like I learned every day that I, I worked on the trial, I learned something from, from the families. Um, for me, one of the most interesting things that I came away with from the trial was, you know, as the trial progressed, we realized um, and we're seeing how difficult it was for families to make the um, – to travel to New York to um, get follow-up for the trial and really highlighted one of the challenges that um, we face not just in Batons but in many disorders where um, kids who are severely affected, uh, travel becomes a, a really huge challenge. And so we were lucky and were able to get the resources to actually start doing house calls. Um, and so I got to visit um, visit families at their homes to do the follow-ups uh, for, for many of our families. Um, and in doing so, really got to see a, a very different side of this disease than I was seeing just at the, the hospital, um, seeing how this disease affects not just the, the patient, but the entire family in terms of where they live and how they live. And um, for me, really raised this issue of, of respite care that's so needed for, for so many of these families and parents who are basically caretakers 24 hours a day seven days a week for, for year after year. Um, anyway, that's a, a short answer, but it was a, it was a very uh, interesting uh, experience. I would also like to highlight, too, that um, BDSRA helped fund that, that quote, homework that Dr. Yohei mm -hmm. did. Um, and the reason we were able to was that a family came forward, a bereaved family came forward, and they had money left over from fundraisers they did when their child was alive. And they wanted that money to go to translational research um, in CLN2. And so um, I doubt that we funded the entire effort, but uh, we funded some of your flights. So we were, we were happy to help. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just, in, um, in deference to the time, like to draw the webinar to a close, I will say that there are several questions that are still in the Q&A, and what we will do is respond to those questions offline in writing. Um, and Great. I'm sorry, we weren't able to get to all of the questions during our allotted time, but really want to thank everyone for being present today on the call. A recording of the webinar will be available on the uh, website, on our website, ambrygen.com. Um, within the next few days, and you are welcome to download that, forward it to anyone you'd like. And I just would really like to extend our deep appreciation to both Dr. Frazier and Dr. Yohei for being present on the call today and helping us really to bring um, further awareness to the importance of um, really understanding education and support for Batten disease. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.